Well, I know it's the top of the hour because I just got my green bin and recycling notification for tomorrow. <laughs> so welcome everyone uh, to our Tuesday webinar. This one is a very, they're all really special to me, of course, uh, but this one's really special in the sense that you know, we can get accustomed to using coma therapy in our day-to-day -day taking care, managing, let's say, long-term issues. But there's also coma's application in really like critical conditions uh, that a lot of people aren't aware of. So today we're going to have a presentation on that, and that's going to be done by one of our Radiant Life Technologies family members, Maxim Miranenko. Maxim's in the Ukraine. And he's, well, he's integral to everything we do at coma therapy and more besides. So Maxim's going to do a presentation today on coma in these kind of situations. We want to address the questions that are directly pertinent to the presentation first, and then we can address others time permitting after. Now, there's a lot of different stories out there. Someone wrote me just before the meeting. And they said, look, I just wanted to share this little story about a critical care situation. If some of you have experience on that and you'd like to share it in the call when we get through the presentation, that's also welcome to and appreciate it. Because this is a discussion more than just a, let's say it's not a lecture. We want to open that discussion and have the interaction between us all. So feel free to share. We will ask you to wait till the presentation is completed. And you can write in the chat. And if you prefer, like you don't want to write in the chat or you can't figure out how to do it, don't worry about that. You can turn your microphone on after. And if we've got a lot of people who've written in the chat and we have people who want to talk, maybe we'll alternate between. But anyway, we're flexible on the setup. The main thing I want you to know for now is this is really cool presentation. I got the preview on it. I'm sure you're all going to enjoy it. So. At this point, I'd like to hand it over to Maxime. Maxime, would you care to share with us today uh, what you have to offer in that way, that presentation? Uh, thank you, Garrett. Uh, glad uh, to be here uh, today presenting, and uh, really uh, thank you for uh, the opportunity. Uh, today, uh, I'm uh, uh, going to share uh, two personal cases uh, about uh, the way I uh, was uh, working with some critical situations in my life and also share some uh, approaches that I was using and what learning I took out of uh, those situations. And I also know that many people here in, in, in this uh, presentation and also who are not uh, here at the moment that have encountered uh, critical situations in their uh, journey, in their uh, healing uh, journey. And um, I would like them, if they are here also, to share, because uh, I, I believe this will help everyone of us to be ready for such cases. Uh, I'm uh, working with Radiant Life Technologies for many years. I live and uh, uh, I'm from uh, Ukraine, so I'm currently in Ukraine. And uh, yeah, sometimes you may have talked uh, with me over the chat or in email and uh, you know, now you will know who are <laughs> you are talking with and it will may be easier for you to communicate. Uh, okay, uh, I will start the presentation and you will help me if you see everything uh, correct. Just a second. Okay, do you see it now? Yes, we, I can see it, Maxine. Yeah. Okay, good. Very good. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, I call it overcoming fear. Why overcoming fear? Uh, uh, because it is not only about uh, what uh, and how practically to apply uh, Comra therapy. Uh, it is more about uh, uh, what limits uh, are there and uh, how to, you know, to really explore those limits uh, with, uh, uh, in critical situation. Uh, first I will share uh, my, uh, uh, ah, 
uh, in two words. Uh, as uh, Garrett mentioned, uh, what we may know already is uh, it is very uh, common to use uh, comer therapy for pain relief for all kind of uh, prevention therapies, uh, long-term conditions and well-being. Some of uh, uh, people may know, some may not know that in critical uh, uh, situations uh, where you are in intensive care unit, where you are dealing with doctors, with hospitals and uh, everything like this, you can also apply homotherapy very successfully and uh, uh, it can become a life-saving tool. Stroke, severe infections, critical trauma, injury and uh, organs failure. What I learned uh, uh, in such a situation is uh, uh, that we always uh, can choose our journey. And it is important because uh, we all encountered, uh, 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 let's say, hospital environment. Sometimes it may be a, a journey which is not very pleasant and not very uh, empowering. So it is up to us uh, how we approach this. Um, so what I found is important uh, uh, to prepare for such situations is, first of all, having personal experience. Uh, even in small things, when we learned from experience that Comra works, it will much help in critical situations because in critical situations, our knowledge is being tested. Uh, everyone, everything uh, that we, we knew uh, before will be tested. Uh, I found myself uh, uh, in a situation where I needed to uh, kind of uh, cross the boundaries. Just because, you know, in hospital, for example, you will come with Comra and uh, you may hear like doctors saying, no, no, you cannot take it here or you cannot do uh, your treatments, uh, for example, here. But uh, uh, it is not like that because our health is, is, is our responsibility in the first place. And sometimes it is needed to be firm in what we know and uh, in such situations. And uh, this is the next item as well, standing firm in, in our knowledge and what we know already. This uh, often is required in situations where especially you are surrounded by people, whether it is your family, friends, uh, doctors, all people are having their opinions and those opinions uh, may influence uh, some decisions. So sometimes you, you need to stand firm in what you know. And uh, another aspect uh, is uh, I can often hear uh, um, doctor will know better or uh, uh, this is something I cannot learn. It requires uh, like seven years or eight years of university. But what I found, if you're encountering some critical condition uh, with your uh, close uh, person uh, or yourself, about this one particular personal uh, situation, you can learn quite a lot, even without having special education, uh, in very short space of time, you can learn quite a lot of things that will be useful for uh, your uh, comrade treatments, for your uh, journey, healing journey, and uh, uh, getting best results. Uh, so first case uh, I would share, uh, it was uh, very similar to what we have now as uh, this uh, COVID uh, disease. But it was many years ago, it was also viral pneumonia, a bit different than COVID because, uh, different than COVID-19, uh, uh, because there were some other coronaviruses before, uh, also some of them were causing uh, pneumonia. So we don't know what kind of uh, virus it was, but what we know, it was uh, uh, viral pneumonia, and it was uh, one by one uh, happening to, to everyone in, in our family. I had a, a, a son and daughter and uh, it all started with me. It started uh, uh, with me. I had very mild symptoms, two, three days uh, of fever, not more. 
Uh, but then my uh, daughter, uh, 11 years at that time, uh, daughter started to have uh, this uh, fever and this uh, turned into dry cough. Uh, what was uh, uh, diagnosed by our uh, doctor, family doctor, as bronchitis. Uh, but later we found out uh, differently. So it was very severe case of dry cough for three weeks. Uh, difficulty breathing some in some moments and uh, what we did uh, we have been consulting our doctor uh, quite often every three days every four days we was consulting with doctor she could uh, uh, work with a child uh, hear uh, her breathing etc and this was calming to us because uh, we found that situation is not that critical Yes, there are noises, yes, there are difficulty breathing, but this is not end of the world. So this helped us uh, to manage perception and uh, uh, keep calm. Um, what we have been doing, uh, uh, we have been using Universal 3 and uh, Pulmonology 1 uh, treatments. And uh, we were doing this uh, constantly from day one and uh, very like persistent. Uh, and intensive treatments. Uh, since uh, coffee was not going uh, anywhere, uh, we were also adding uh, additional special exercises for uh, uh, coughing for, uh, let's say, better uh, lung condition. And this helped. So three weeks uh, my daughter uh, went uh, well. Then my son uh, got uh, the virus. Three weeks, again, very intensive uh, care, very very intensive uh, work uh, with Comra and exercises, and he went well. However, uh, the last uh, 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 three weeks, uh, what has happened? My wife uh, got the virus. And uh, she went to another doctor, not our family doctor, but doctor in, in, in general hospital. This was three days after uh, uh, her fever uh, started. So she went to the doctor and uh, she was sent to X-ray. And uh, this uh, uh, actually changed the situation because on X-ray they seen that uh, she had a pneumonia. And this was uh, frightening. Uh, I was not uh, with her at the moment, so she was interacting with doctor. And of course, uh, this all happened very quickly. She was uh, uh, prescribed a course of antibiotics, intramuscular, a very uh, intensive course of various antibiotics for 21 days. And uh, this was really uh, something uh, that was a moment of uh, panic, but then it uh, uh, resulted in, in, in this experience. So what have happened? Uh, she has still uh, uh, had uh, her three weeks of uh, healing uh, of antibiotics, antibiotics plus Comra. But then, uh, you know, antibiotics have uh, side effects with uh, gut uh, microflora and some other things. So the whole experience was uh, uh, unpleasant and painful because it was intramuscular antibiotics. antibiotics. So, yeah, this is how a moment of uh, uh, panic may change uh, uh, the course of the journey. And uh, after this, we, we, we learned uh, 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 once again that this is very important, how we approach, what kind of tests we do, and whether we take time to absorb uh, the results of those tests and what uh, decisions uh, we take. And often uh, it is uh, most important to, to talk to someone, not to take the decision uh, alone. So in those in, in this uh, situation, what have helped uh, me? 
uh, is to have huge experience. I have already several years of experience with Comra. I was from uh, day one uh, actively approaching the whole process. Uh, I was uh, open to input because, uh, you know, cough uh, was not going away and, and difficulty breathing required some extra steps. So we, we did uh, found a solution in terms of uh, doing physical exercises. Uh, and uh, of course, persisting uh, in the process. What have not helped uh, in this is going into panic mode. Any moment of going into panic mode may impact uh, the decisions. And uh, this is uh, critical because once you take the decision, sometimes it is not possible to, to stop what would uh, come next. Uh, and not knowing, of course, uh, limits of Comra, because uh, one thing is, is to uh, know Comra in, in uh, uh, normal day-to-day -day, uh, use, and another is to know Comra in critical situation. And also focus on the outcome, uh, because uh, we understood in the process uh, the value of journey, uh, because it is possible uh, to focus on the outcome, and as a result, have not a good outcome and having no journey uh, as well. So we, we understood the importance of having a meaningful journey. So this is very much connected to what uh, Garrett uh, uh, uncovered in his uh, webinar about uh, healing journey physically and beyond. So for those who have not uh, been on that webinar, have not seen the recording, I highly recommend to see it uh, because it is very much connected to what I'm sharing today. Uh, next case um, is not uh, about, uh, it is about family member, but it is about uh, small uh, family member small family member, it is about my dog. Uh, my dog uh, named Mary, uh, she was uh, three years old at the time. Uh, the breed name is miniature uh, schnauzer. It is mini schnauzer. We have uh, two dogs of the same uh, breed. One is uh, much older uh, and uh, now she's uh, 12 years old at that moment. Uh, Another dog was 11 years old, and another dog name is Barry. So we have two dogs, Mary and Barry. So what has happened, uh, and it is often happen uh, happens uh, to dogs, is uh, uh, through the, through tick bite, uh, uh, they have uh, parasites. Parasites uh, similar to malaria, malaria uh, parasites, and uh, they are very very uh, aggressive those parasites, they are uh, dwelling inside um, red blood cell. They tear uh, the red blood cell apart. So what happens, animal loses 50% uh, and more of all red blood cells as a result. It would not be a problem if uh, as a result, it, you know, the whole body starts and tissues starts to uh, lack oxygen and uh, start to die. Uh, organs, uh, uh, nervous system start uh, to die because of lack of oxygen and this becomes a rolling process. So it is very uh, deadly disease. Uh, if not treated, it most often leads to full or partial paralysis of uh, the animal or death. Uh, in order to treat, you need to take highly poisonous uh, substance that will kill the parasite. And we had a previous experience with other dog where things went better because uh, we were uh, treating her much early with that um, substance that kills the parasite and it was not uh, uh, leading to huge loss of uh, red blood cells. So it was early treatment and then it worked. But now uh, uh, what have happened is uh, we went through 
uh, number of critical situations uh, because uh, uh, diagnosis was late and it was not correct in, in the beginning. What we encountered in our journey is kidney failure, uh, leg paralysis, uh, severe anemia, and uh, our dog went uh, fully blind. Uh, so it was uh, a journey of five weeks from the tick bite to uh, our final examination was in the hospital where we went. Initially, uh, as I mentioned, we were working with another uh, veterinary clinic, small one, and uh, we were misdiagnosed uh, there and uh, treated uh, late. All the way, we were treating uh, with Comra from the day one. Uh, when we were uh, admitted to hospital, we already have very poor uh, kidney function and uh, low uh, red blood uh, cells uh, count. Uh, but then I will share the, the full journey as, as we go through the slides. I will uh, share more. Several times through this journey, we were very close to the panic mode but uh, we were doing uh, everything on maximum of our uh, abilities. So in the first week, everything was happening fast. Tick bite, uh, one, two, three days, symptoms of weakness in fever. Then we were diagnosed with inflammation. Inflammation of uh, uh, lower part of her body. Maybe it was uh, uh, Uretrus or uh, whatever, uh, but the, she was diagnosed with inflammation and we were treating her with Comra for that. Then we saw more and more red uh, urine coming and uh, we understood something is wrong. So in the end of first week, after additional tests, we found uh, that it is parasite. Uh, next day, uh, our dog had a, a blood test and uh, doctors found uh, that uh, she has a kidney failure. Uh, there is a blood uh, uh, one factor called creatinine uh, which is showing how uh, good uh, kidneys are filtering the blood. And it was at uh, 750. Uh, for the dog, 750 uh, is firstly uh, five times uh, higher than normal. And uh, let's say over the thousand, uh, if creatinine goes over the thousand, normally kidney function will, will not return ever and uh, uh, dog will die from kidney failure. Uh, so, the same day as we were diagnosed uh, with kidney failure, uh, what I did, I, I went to see uh, how kidneys are located in, in dog. I uh, started to treat uh, with uh, 905 uh, delta laser, uh, ultrasound on, uh, 50 uh, hertz, and I, I did this uh, treatment for hour and a half. Uh, after one hour, we saw that there is uh, urine coming out. Because normally, if you have uh, kidney failure, ur urine is not coming uh, out. So we started to see that something is happening, something is working. And I found uh, later why uh, it was uh, working this way. Also, another thing I did, I found a, a clinic uh, which has a 24-hour intensive care for animals, uh, cats and dogs mostly, and they can do blood transfusions because if you have a critical uh, kidney failure, you may need a, a blood transfusion. So I called them and we went, uh, after one and a half hour treatment at home, we went to that uh, hospital and stayed there uh, for another uh, two weeks. When we came to the hospital, uh, we were tested again for creatinine. And already in the hospital, creatinine went down to 250. 
this is three times from down from what we have earlier in the day. So this happened uh, in, in several hours. This happened between 12 uh, in the afternoon in the day uh, till uh, seven in the evening. So seven hours from one test to another. So what was good is that the clinic we went to, they were doing a regular uh, blood uh, panel. Uh, we were having the full uh, count of all uh, factors and uh, we were having them every other day. So as you see here on the graph, um, the first day it was really high up in the sky. Uh, the same day it went down and every other day when we were doing additional treatments uh, we saw this is uh, uh, going down mostly going down uh, besides end of uh, second week because in the end of second week we started we changed the diet uh, diet of the dog because of very low and i will show on the next slide because of the very low red blood uh, count uh, she needed uh, a lot of uh, red meat uh, rich uh, diet because uh, she needed to restore uh, blood count otherwise her organs will start to die. Uh, when uh, she came uh, to the clinic, her back legs were already paralyzed. Pa paralyzed fully means she could not move. Uh, she can only sit, uh, but not uh, even uh, move a little bit. Uh, the back legs. Uh, so this uh, was also nervous uh, system problem that was of course affected by uh, toxins in the blood as well as uh, hypoxia from uh, uh, lack of oxygen from uh, not enough red blood cells uh, in the hospital we agreed uh, they would do uh, uh, general treatment glucose mineral solutions uh, diuretics diuretics are uh, for uh, keeping uh, uh, urination, uh, for keeping kidneys open and urination happening. And they used urinary catheter initially to improve uh, urination. We rejected having uh, anti-inflammatory uh, drugs because from our experience, anti-inflammatory uh, drugs are very uh, detrimental and would uh, have unpredictable consequences. With Comra treatments, we focused on blood and kidneys. Later on also liver and major organ systems, but I will explain. Okay, so red uh, blood uh, cells count. Uh, we have here two graphs. One is red uh, blood uh, cells count and another is uh, hemoglobin. Uh, hemoglobin is uh, oxygen carrying substance in, in red blood cells. Uh, basically you see that hemoglobin in the red uh, blood cells count very much related. So by the day five, uh, she went to very low zone uh, in, in terms of her red blood cells count, around 70. And this was, uh, doctor uh, said, if we go any further down, we will need to do a blood transfusion because otherwise uh, brain will, will suffer uh, from oxy lack of oxygen, organs will suffer and dog will start dying one organ after another. So we focused on uh, treating blood, we focused on also treating um, area of kidneys because area of kidneys is producing a hormone uh, called erythropoietin which is uh, uh, stimulates uh, red blood cells uh, production. 
normally it takes uh, seven days uh, for a red blood cells uh, cell to mature from young uh, to fu fully mature. So as you see exactly, it was uh, six days, seven, and after seven uh, days, uh, let me go back. After day seven, here, you see already improvement in uh, blood cells count. So when I saw the first improvement, I understood that things are on track. Basically, this was uh, uh, most important to see that things are going up and with uh, this uh, test, it was clear that things are going uh, in the right direction. Uh, at that moment, log dog started uh, to lose uh, her sight. Uh, we understood that she is seeing uh, uh, worse and worse. And uh, by that time, uh, by the date, the day eight, she was almost not seeing at all. But we decided we will come to that and start treating that later on because first was uh, uh, saving her uh, kidneys and uh, blood and liver because liver also uh, started to fail. Uh, we had, uh, as I mentioned, uh, 20 plus uh, uh, blood factors every other day. Uh, one of the factors uh, that I was personally using uh, for my understanding of where the general uh, health uh, of uh, the dog is, is uh, lymphocytes count in percentage, in percentage of total uh, white blood cells. So lymphocytes count was very low for the first uh, two weeks, which is a sign of um, very stressed uh, si system. It was uh, around four, five percent. Uh, this always a sign of uh, very stressed uh, system. Only after about uh, 10 days, we started to see it going up very fast. And then I knew things are uh, turning uh, out of the critical situation. And uh, we added uh, brain, spine, eye treatment. Uh, by the way, by that time, uh, a dog started already standing. So if you see this here on the picture, her legs are a bit uh, looking apart. Uh, this uh, uh, means uh, she is very, very weak in her legs. But then uh, already next day or day after, uh, she started to walk. Uh, although very slowly and not being sure yet and not seeing much at the moment, but she was walking and uh, this was the uh, first sign because before she was just sitting and when we saw a uh, dog is walking, seven, eight day, day, days after being in hospital, we were happy. So after two weeks, uh, we were uh, discharged from the hospital as we saw that uh, things have improved dramatically, no need to stay there. We were, we were having all kinds of uh, prescriptions after uh, we left the hospital, uh, but we ignored uh, them all, all prescriptions because I knew by the time that it is not prescriptions or drugs that are working with dog. We continue to treat her eyesight and uh, after two weeks uh, staying at home uh, she has uh, returned uh, around 50 percent of her eyesight uh, we went uh, to ophthalmologist and uh, he said that this was a big uh, uh, blood uh, uh, a lot of blood in the eye because of 
high pressure, uh, most probably, and uh, it was going away, and she was uh, regaining her sight, her uh, movement, and everything. Uh, doctors, when saw after two weeks, uh, dog, uh, first of all, could not really understand if this was the same dog. Uh, they were like, but probably this was this is another. Is it really the same? So they were not that much sure. And uh, yes, uh, we, we told this is the same dog, and everything went uh, well after that. Uh, she is still not seeing fully. Uh, she is uh, having full uh, uh, grasp of her uh, legs and everything. It is working very well. But she is not seeing fully, still uh, like 50% of sight means she is not seeing far away. Like she need glasses or something, but other than that, she is happy and uh, merry dog. Uh, what have, have helped in, in this situation is willingness to learn. I learned a lot about dog anatomy, physiology, how things interact. I went uh, to understand how kidney work in, in very much details. That's why I was, uh, uh, as I mentioned before, understanding why one hour treatment gave uh, immediate results. Because bef because uh, besides long-term effect of Comra for kidneys, there is also short-term effect. Uh, because kidney require for filtering function quite a lot of energy. Uh, and this uh, mentioned in literature, is it requires a lot of ATP. ATP is energy molecule. Uh, Comra uh, helps uh, kidneys to uh, have this uh, energy. And that's why Comra gives immediate results with kidneys and also long-term uh, effects as well. Uh, I have been very firm in my knowledge. I have signed uh, all the papers with doctors, uh, taking responsibility for outcomes of uh, applying Comra. I was not feeling stupid sitting there in the hospital with uh, uh, treating uh, dog with uh, Delta. And I was sitting there alone and treating and doctors was coming by and asking, looking at me, asking what I'm doing, but I was doing what I was doing. And I had full support from my family because we took turns uh, in uh, visiting hospital. It, requires, it required a lot of logistics. Uh, what have not helped is not trusting my gut initially with, with, because I was seeing the symptoms and I, I have a gut feeling that uh, this was uh, this disease initially from the symptoms. I had a feeling that this is it. But then I went with initial doctor's uh, diagnosis for the inflammation, and this uh, took those two, three days we needed to have uh, early, earlier uh, treatment and approach. Uh, this is it. Uh, thank you very much, and I would be uh, happy to answer if any questions on my presentations. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maxi. That was an excellent presentation. Uh, before we get into the questions and discussion, I just, you know, you present this very matter of factly, uh, but really we can't really, uh, <laughs> which, which made me kind of laugh throughout, you know, you're sitting there and just, Relax presenting, but this is really like amazing things happening here. This is not what people would expect to have this experience. So people with coma therapy, they're like, oh yeah, okay, this is kind of run of the mill coma stuff that happens where the body heals and the person gets on with their life and you know, your furry family member in this case and all of these things. But if we go outside of the circle of coma therapy, this is not the norm. I, I just, I really can't stress that this enough because we could go through thing after thing like this and think that, well, if you don't have, let's say you don't have direct medical knowledge, a lot of knowledge on different things in medicine, you think, well, okay, this, I guess this happens all the time. Like 
but it doesn't. It, it just doesn't happen all the time. This is like the doctors, is that the same dog? How can this be? And I know there's lots of stories out there with coma like that. I just wanted to put that out there, Maxine, you know, I had to not, I didn't want to be laughing through your presentation, but <laughs> uh, uh, you know, it just, I really enjoyed the presentation as well. Thank you. And uh, because I'm the moderator, I got a chance to speak first. So I'm just going to say, I really want to salute your care. Like, this is another thing with coma. People care. They really care about the people around them and their furry family members. You know, sometimes we care about our furry family members more than ourselves. <laughs> and coma is a really practical way that you can give that care, you know, like you going into the hospital day after day, you and your family taking shifts to go in and do the treatment. That goes a long way, yeah. And for anybody who isn't familiar, that care is an analgesic in itself, a pain relieving thing, because what it does is it focuses our intent on upliftment, the support, it focuses our intent in a really positive direction. So this is why another reason why taking action is so critical, because if we just go hands off, like you said at the beginning, Maxime, hands off, oh, well, the doctors got, are in charge of it. That empty space, no matter what you think, gets filled. And if we aren't filling it actively, it gets filled by default. And most of the time, I will, I'm willing to bet money with anybody here, that default is mostly going to be with fear and negativity about the outcome. Whereas that positive care in action with, in this case, coma therapy, of course it can be done in different ways, but with coma therapy, really, yeah, it can't be overstated. So, okay, I'm going to stop there for myself. Thank you. Maxime, excellent presentation. Very exciting. Yeah. Thank you, so Gail. Yes, and I'd like to just open it up right now if anybody wants to unmute themselves. Uh, I'd like to. Please, go ahead. Okay. Oh, uh, hi, first Denise. Of all, yeah. Hi, Gert. Um, I, I, yeah, I would really, I'm really impressed, Maxim. That's fantastic. I, uh, I truly wish we'd had access to the, um, to the Comra back when my other daughter's schnauzer was having problems, but they followed what the uh, vets had said, and he actually had to be euthanized. Anyway, as for my dog, um, or dogs, I've had several. Um, back in 2009, this is not the kidney access, but <laughs> my, uh, my dog, uh, decided to chase a rabbit and she, I don't know what, anyway, she strained both her back cruciate muscles and, and ligaments, I should say, and I ended up having to carry her everywhere, out, out to have a pee, into the car, out of the car. It, it's a lot of work and dedication and uh, that brings me back to all the work you went through with your dog um, it's, it's just immense, every, all the care, but that's what we feel for our animals. Anyway, um, yeah, they just didn't think anything, I could do anything with my dog's back legs. They just said, well, you know, you could have a lot of surgery. And I thought, oh, I can't really afford that. But I had, um, I had dealt with her, like I said, just taking her in and out, in and out all the time. Uh, but then I had access to uh, to the Delta from Avril and Garrett, and I started using that on her, and it started really improving. I had no medical knowledge, obviously, but it started to improve her. She could stand better on the back legs, and then she'd start moving as time went on. She started moving more and trying to hop up and do what she could for herself. Um, and then I noticed she could get down the stairs to go outside by herself. So it was really helping. And that was what I was going on is that, oh, well, this, this is helping. This is really helping. And then I got her off the metformin, which is the anti-inflammatory, because I knew that wasn't very great for her. But I, anyway, I took her off that because she was improving with the Delta. 
Um, anyway, that was in uh, 2010, I guess. And then in 2013, um, we, we moved, the dog and I moved, so she had no idea where she was supposed to go to go outside. So she kept holding her urine. And um, anyway, eventually what happened is she was weakening her kidneys. And then winter came here and I live in a condo and they started using that ice melt. And she was drinking that, or, you know, instead of, uh, instead of just drinking out of her water bowl. And the salt and everything in there really affected her kidneys. So they started shutting down and I, like I said, I don't have the medical knowledge, but she started urinating and there was blood in it and she, then she couldn't pee at all, um, which was just, I was, I was panicking. But I, uh, I think Avril and Garrett both had said to me something about using the Delta. So I started using that on her and it was a bit, you know, it was a bit late, but it did, it did help a lot. And um, in time, everything cleared up and, and she was, she was good. She, she lived, well, at that time she was 13. So she lived until she was 16 and a half and had a good life. Um, another thing I've done with the Delta, which to me was a bit of a crisis. Uh, my mother was in a nursing home and she had, um, she had a skin breakdown, a very bad one. And I was going against their wishes and just going in and treating my mom with the Delta. And, uh, of course they said, oh, well, they were using all their special treatment and, but I knew that when that did start to heal up. It wasn't because of their treatment. It was because of the Delta uh, in addition to it. So um, anyway, that's, that's my story on that. So thank, uh, you. thank you. That's very lovely. And one thing you didn't mention because you before uh, years ago when this happened, Zoe's bladder actually collapsed the ultrasound and they said she's going to die. And that's said, right. Well, I'm going to do it anyway. And they couldn't believe that the bladder, that she lived through that. Because once a dog's bladder collapses, they say, well, it's not really possible for them to live. So just wanted to add that yes, detail. Lovely story. Yeah. And again, that care. Well done. Yeah. Yeah. The care for the, your furry family members. Yeah. Okay. So we have some... Okay, we have some questions here, Maxime. Uh, one question comes from, uh, Edwin was asking, like, before your wife, excuse me, let me see, did she have a productive cough before the 20, the 21 day antibiotic treatment? By productive, was she able to expel any mucus before that or was it the dry hack like the rest of you had? Uh, no, there, there were no cough uh, at all. Uh, this was uh, fever only. Cough uh, all has started much later, uh, maybe after one week. So pneumonia was there before the cough. There were no signs of uh, uh, pneumonia. No, uh, besides just uh, normal fever, like uh, okay. this answers the question. And what happened? Uh, she was having. Uh, let's say after effects of uh, uh, the coughing uh, two months after uh, uh, everything uh, more or less finished. And was this different than your 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 son and your daughter? Is that what you're? Yes. That what you're somehow, that? somehow it was uh, worse. Somehow it was worse than what has happened uh, to my. Uh, son and daughter, I, it can be attributed to maybe they are younger and their immune system is better. Or maybe she was uh, stressed uh, with uh, all of that. Or maybe an antibiotics somehow made it worse. I don't know. But uh, after effects were uh, worse than uh, with uh, children. Thank you, Maxine. Uh, Edwin, thank you for the question. If it hasn't been answered, uh, 
yeah, we can go over it again. But I just want to go to a question from Lola because it ties in directly. And Lola, I'm just going to read your question, and then you can come on the mic uh, after if you like. I'm curious to know if Maxine's wife, uh, being the last to get sick and being worse in symptoms, so in that context, whether her viral load was larger and for a longer time, and also she had any prior lung issues. And then with that, you know, of course, and was worry and concern, she's mother, you know, uh, about the family, a major factor in depressing her immune system. You know, where mother bear goes, to, she's going to look after everybody. And then, you know, and then any history to go with that. Uh, yeah. Um, yes, I would say uh, that uh, whatever the virus was, uh, my, uh, of course, we didn't had any antibody or other types of test uh, at the moment. But my uh, feeling for that uh, virus is uh, it required quite a, a lot of uh, viruses to get really infected because it was spreading really slow. This was my uh, feeling of it because on only three weeks after you know the initial uh, uh, way and first my daughter my daughter had. Uh, uh, problem uh, with lungs in her childhood and she went uh, first uh, so me because I was not having too much symptoms so I suspect I was not producing too much viral load as such so then my daughter went uh, really seriously uh, affected by, by it and most probably she was producing uh, quite a significant viral load that uh, was uh, because she's also living in the same room with my son at that moment uh, first affected my son and for my wife i'm seeing that it is all the stress of those two months uh, fighting with the disease of the children and also viral load led to this uh, result so this is my take on it thank you very much maxine lola does that answer your question Yes, thank you. Correct. Thank you for the question, Lola. So there's a couple of comments here, and I don't know if anybody wants to expand on them. Uh, Donna, you'd said, you know, gives hope and trust to our instinct, which is very well said. I don't know if you wanted to add more to that. If you do, it just because it sounds like you're speaking from experience as well. So if you would like to add anything, you can. If not, that's fine too. But yes, well said. Okay. And then... Gar, if I may? Yes, please. Yeah, yeah. Arjan. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Maxim, thank you for the presentation. This is most interesting. Uh, most interesting cases. I mean, it's your, it's your family, so it's very close to skin. Really love the presentation, really love the presentation. Um, regarding the first uh, cases we described is uh, pneumonia and the viral, uh, viral infection going in the family. The question I have, Maxim, uh, when you first got the infection and, and you, you had, I guess, suspicion, you know, it's some sort of a viral, viral thing, did you introduce uh, some sort of preventative treatment for the rest of the family? Or, you know, it was only up, up until, you know, they get sick themselves. So my first question. Uh, yes, uh, it was only much later uh, because uh, I, I'm, I was at that moment treating myself uh, regularly. So for me, things went uh, really unnoticeably uh, like, I don't know, some very mild flu. And I was not uh, that much uh, expecting that uh, it would be something uh, uh, serious. And then, uh, you know, as things started to develop, initially, since this was a bronchitis, uh, it was not really clear what kind of it. So it was only maybe after three weeks or four, I, I started to, to see the pattern and understand that this is a virus 
which is just going from one person to another in our family. And uh, since my wife, and she was doing uh, some occasional uh, preventative treatments, but not uh, very regularly. And uh, generally, she's not very prone to disease. Uh, so we thought it, it will go okay. Okay, okay, thank you, clear. And uh, regarding uh, when you described uh, the situation with Mary, with your dog, what I really liked how we approached uh, designing a treatment, and especially, um, you know, when you described that first situation, when they had like 750 really high, and then you do a treatment and it's dropping to 250. And then, then you start using this as a market to see, you know, what treatments to do, what organs to focus and so on. And I think this is actually the way to go with any condition. As long as we understand what organ is involved in the disease, you know, okay, kidney, liver, very broad geography, you know, very broad. As long as we understand what organs are involved, we can do the treatment. And Maxim, a question I have, when you start treating a dog, let's say hour and a half, it means you would come to the hospital and you would do it like all, all at once because after that you have to leave the hospital. Was it the case or I misunderstood? No, uh, this uh, was not the case. When we first treated, uh, very first treatment, uh, hour and a half uh, uh, before going to hospital, this was in one go uh, for the mm -hmm. kidneys. But after that, it was never the case. Uh, uh, I was coming, uh, one of us was coming in the morning and in the evening. So this was twice a day. Uh, 40 minutes each uh, time and this may also be a different treatment depending on what uh, uh, blood test we get in, in the day because you know th with this condition I very first time understood uh, yeah, that in critical disease there is always some limiting condition so I had to look what is now limiting condition because all systems are interrelated they affect each other so I had to focus on the system that is limiting now all systems with, with its performance, so to speak. So if I saw from the tests that this is, uh, let's say, blood system, I was focusing on not results, because, for example, paralysis is a result. It is not, um, let's say, disease in itself. It is a result of the disease. So I was firstly focusing on what caused this uh, to happen. And in those uh, things that cost this maybe kidneys, and kidney actually involves a lot of things together. It is adrenal glands, it is erythropoietin, it is uh, also uh, kidneys itself urinating. And uh, also I was treating uh, spleen when uh, I saw that uh, uh, inflammation is high, but lymphocytes is low. And so, so what I see, Maxim, in, in a critical condition, when we're talking about critical organ failure, what's really important is to get that support very timely. In other words, you know, organ only, you know, operating, let's say, 10% of its capacity, you know, 15% of its capacity. And it, the energy buffer or whatever, the functional buffer is extremely small. And, you know, we improve it, let's say, by another 20, 30% for a few hours, and then again, slow goes down. Once I also got uh, some sort of very weird infection, and I actually felt that, you know, I need to do a treatment uh, every three, four hours, like round the clock, round the clock, round the clock. And later, that experience has repeated several times, and actually, I felt very clearly when I do the treatment, I feel so much better. Like, you know, immediately, the first 10, 15 minutes, like, you know, this is almost gone. But then I'm getting you know, weaker, 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 weaker. Okay, I need to do retreatment again. So, again, Maxim, thank you very much. This is just most excellent, uh, you know, description how we can approach a situation when, uh, you know, we treat a dog. You know, we cannot obviously ask the dog, you know, what, what's hurting you and doing this uh, stuff. 
drink, are you tired, you know, but you can observe using, for example, the blood panel and change the focus. Okay, let's focus on the kidney, let's focus on the liver, so on. Fantastic, thank you very much. And this guy shared, you know, it's just the amount of care we can provide for the dog and for the family. Thank you. Thank you, Arjan. Thank you, Arjan. Thank you, Maxim. Maxim, I wanted to ask you, you know, the case report is very factual and these kind of things, but what was it like for you under the pressure of the doctors and like the vets of we need to do this because X, Y, Z? Like, can you speak a bit more to that? Because this is, I mean, this is, everyone goes through it. Any kind of illness, even if it's a minor thing, you know, we have this conditioning. If someone has that white lab coat on, they know, I don't know, you know, and it's very easy to be, take that passive role and, and step back. It's okay to have the guidance. Obviously, we need the guidance, but that step back. So how did, can you share your experience of managing that and going through it? I mean, it's not an easy situation and everyone can relate. Uh, yes, Garrett. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, you know, uh, I, of course, needed to manage uh, perception of family members uh, because uh, uh, they do not have that much experience as I do. Uh, so, let me interrupt you for a second. What do you mean by manage perception of the family members? Uh, I, I, I needed to, to explain uh, how things work uh, to my wife, uh, to my uh, children as well. Uh, I needed to uh, ensure that things will work and we will find a solution. Uh, so I needed to, to keep calm and uh, persist uh, with the treatment uh, because uh, um, any moment uh, I, 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 I needed their support for all the moments. So I was uh, enlisting them with that support ensuring them that everything will be fine, we'll find a solution. And uh, uh, this was the first uh, critical thing that took uh, some time. Uh, maybe first uh, two, three days, they were uh, a little bit in panic mode, but then we went okay with the program and it became like, we decided we do this and we did. Uh, the second uh, critical uh, thing uh, that was happening in that moment where we got uh, this uh, blood test with uh, 750. Uh, because uh, immediately our all feelings and, uh, you know, all emotions all went down. And immediately, like, it is not possible to fight. It is it. Is, it is it. It is... Uh, 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 not possible to do anything. So this was the first uh, emotion and feeling and thought that came. And in that moment, there was a firm decision that came, no, we will try and we will do and uh, we will find a solution. So this was managing my own perception and first taking a decision inside myself that uh, we will uh, get uh, through this. So this was second critical uh, moment. And after this, uh, once I taken uh, this decision, uh, I was not returning to this moment of decision. Everything was clear after that. And uh, third moment was in clinics uh, because uh, when I started to talk with the doctors, of course they were interested what is it, Delta, can you explain us, and so on. And initially I was uh, trying to enlist their help as well, and was explaining, brought a manual with me, and uh, explained in details how things work. But uh, they're uh, developing a kind of, how to say, they encountering many things in, in their years of training, and uh, it is very difficult for them to change approach in any way or to perceive anything new without uh, skepticism. Uh, so we uh, like ended up in in neutral, <laughs> uh, like how to say it. It is sometimes said. 
uh, armed neutrality. Uh, so you have to be armed, but uh, you don't have a war. <laughs> so this is uh, what, what we was having with uh, doctors. I was doing my thing. I signed the papers. I was, uh, um, how to say, I was uh, open. I was uh, not uh, ha having any um, uh, uh, reservations or something. I was uh, uh, communicating. Uh, and they were really pl pleasant people and uh, so on. I was communicating very good, but we had a kind of armed neutrality. Uh, so. I'm doing Comra and you, you don't tell me uh, how to do my Comra treatment and I do not tell you, you know, what you do need to do in your uh, profession and uh, so on. So this is what I would say three critical moments in that whole situation. Thank you, Michael. And of course, uh, every, uh, you know, every small uh, sign like tests uh, uh, going down three three times of course i'm immediately messaging to my wife just in order to you know that we see the sign of things going in the right direction we see that the dog is uh, like standing instead of sitting i immediately send the photo and saying look things go in the right direction and so on using every uh, let's say change to confirm that things are g getting to better. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, and then to follow on from that, I want to ask you this question because again, this is a really, everyone can relate to this in their own way. So if you were, I don't want to say advice, but from your experience, what, you know, when you talked about that point of decision, this sounded really critical to me and, you know, making sure you're including your family. Uh, and then once you reach the decision to stand firm in it, when interacting with the doctors, but with that, let's say, and I really like the phrase, arm neutrality. <laughs> so what would you, let's oh, I would just say, what would you advise people to do in that situation where they're facing this, it's critical, and you feel it in your gut because Donna brought it up. You know, what, we need to, to trust in our instincts. It's not an easy situation. So is there anything you would recommend to anyone, any kind of process in that? I mean, I can hear what you went through, but is there anything you draw from that that you would share with someone else to take away? Mm, it is difficult uh, to say if uh, it is really possible to come to this uh, decision uh, consciously uh, because uh, for me it was my previous experience uh, that helped me previous uh, experience where, where i could have done more i think i could have done more but i didn't and things have not went um, well so this helped me to be firm in my decision to understand but not this time this time i'm not uh, i'm not giving up and i would uh, work with this situation as much as it needs to and then we see because we never know so this was uh, how it happened for me i don't know if it would be possible to come to this conclusion otherwise Very well said, thank you. I didn't realize, I wasn't thinking about that other piece, but that, uh, that makes a lot of sense. So there are uh, one or two other things here, and we're gonna get into a question that's a little off topic, not directly off topic, but about using Coma Palm. But before we do that, does anybody else have anything directly related to the presentation uh, that Maxime did or any experience around that that you have a question or a comment about? And then we'll get to general questions about coma or whatever you want to ask. And at that point, I'll just refer to one or two. I do. Yeah, yeah. Gareth. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, it was someone else speaking. Well, whoever else was speaking, Paniota, whoever else was speaking, turn their microphone off. So you're up, Charles. Go okay, ahead, please. Great. Thank you. Um, lovely examples, Maxime. If I could just share a little bit about my first experience with um, the Delta with my elderly dog Rose, who is a 12 and a half year old 
white German shepherd. And she'd been quite, um, you know, she was acting her age. She had back problems and I used to take her every week for acupuncture and Chinese herbal medicine to a very good acupuncturist in Cape Town. And he did very well, but she was still going downhill. Um, and in the car, when I took her to Cape Town, she was sleeping rather than looking out the window. And she was developing urinary incontinence because of her age and also congestive heart failure through a blue, um, build up of fluid on the lungs. So she was going downhill in spite of having the treatments for her spine and the Chinese herbal medicine. And I, I, well, I got the Delta and I didn't know much about it and it was very much an experiment for me. And I started just to treat her quite extensively. So I'd treat her heart, I'd treat her lungs, I'd treat her liver, I'd treat her kidneys. I would uh, do blood irradiation. I would treat the areas of pain on her back and on her legs where she, they were stiff. It took a while, but um, this was probably in September. By Christmas time, she was like a, a very a, a new dog. She wasn't running around like a puppy anymore, but um, when I took her in the car, she was alert. She was looking out the window. She was very keen to observe what was going on. She was just engaged much more with life. And um, the urinary incontinence disappeared. Um, the congestive heart failure cleared up completely. So she didn't have to take medicine for either of those conditions. And I think that um, Comra therapy in the Delta gave her probably about another year, year and a half of life, but also good quality of life. So that was my experience. Thank you, Charles. Lovely. Was your dog, Rose your dog's name? Sorry, I missed the... Yes, yeah. Okay, yeah. thank you. I'm very glad for you and Rose. Yeah, great story. And just want to mention, Penny Odom, we'll come to your question or comment next. I just want to mention everybody, it's really important, you know, maybe it's not obvious, but everything that happens with an animal is interchangeable with a human and vice versa in terms of the treatments and outcomes and what we can do for care. So it just seems simple, but I just wanted to mention. So Paniota, you had something that you wanted to say, please? Yes, thank you, Barrett. Um, just to introduce myself for the people who don't know me. I'm Panayota, I'm from Greece, I live in Greece, and I am with RLT for the last eight years. Um, Maxim, excellent presentation. There are a couple of things that resonated with me very much uh, based on my personal experience. In the slide that you had of what helps and what doesn't help, um, on what helps you had to persist with the treatments, to be persistent. And for me, this is very important because back in uh, 2015, I had a, a degenerative um, meniscus rupture and my uh, you know, knee was swollen and I was limping and I was in pain. And um, I had gone to three um, orthopedic doctors who were telling me that I need to have uh, arthroscopy. And, um, of course, there, there was no way that I would go under the knife. And um, I decided to just do Comra. I didn't take just even one anti-inflammatory pill, even though I was in pain. So I had the Delta 905 at the time. And even though the user guide says uh, for the knee treatment, one minute per point once a day, I was doing two minutes per point three times a day morning, noon, evening. And um, it took me a month and a half to actually heal. And I have to say that at some point around the third week, I was, started, uh, I was starting to get discouraged because I was so used to, to, to the coma working so fast. And it was not giving me the results I wanted. And I got impatient and I was discouraged. And I thought, oh, my God, you know, the doctors are, you know, maybe I have to do orthoscopy. But, but I stayed firm to my knowledge. This was the other thing, also trusting the instinct. And I will uh, share about that very briefly. So I was persistent. 
I did not give up and and I'm fine since uh, I'm, I, I am a co competitive swimmer. I train now that uh, the swimming pools are closed. I go out and I do power walk and jogging eight kilometers a day, uh, five years down the road when they were telling me at the time that if I won't do arthroscopy, I won't be able to go back to my training and I will have problems to do anything uh, around walking or jogging. So that for me, you know, the persistence, when you said that, Maxim, it really, for me, it resonated very much. And the other thing was that um, I, I, I had told one doctor about the Comra, about the Delta, and I asked him, you know, I have this device, does it, will it help? And he said to me, oh, you're ignorant. Uh, cartilage doesn't have blood um, circulation. This thing works well in parts of the body that have blood circulation. There is no way you can regenerate cartilage. You're stupid. And I'm like, okay. And I remember at the time I went back to the RLT family and I asked Arzan, I said, Arzan, this is what the doctor told me. <laughs> what do you have to say? And then Arzan explained to me about, yeah, cartilage has slower regeneration. But it was a great example for me, my own personal experience that, you know, I learned, of course, a lot, you know, through it, but also being persistent for me, it was, it was key. And this is what I also tell, you know, the people or my clients when I talk to them about, about Comra, that they need to be persistent in, in cases that they need more time. So thank you for that, Maxim. That was great. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Gareth. That was, that was it. Thank you, Paniota. Well said. Very good observation and experience, of course. So there is a question now, because we're starting to get from, let's say, critical care to, you pointed out persistence uh, with Charles as well. And then now there's a, let's say, being timious with the treatments. So if, and, uh, if you have some sort of fracture, I'll just give you this example. The lady wrote me, uh, Gladys wrote to me this morning because she said I couldn't make the meeting, but I just wanted to share this with you. A friend of hers fractured her wrist and they need to put pins in. And so Gladys said, look, get the Delta on that right away. They did it. The doctors were like, I don't know how you're healing so fast, but we don't need a cast. We just need a splint. So this is a fracture with pins and usually you get a full cast, all of these things. And Again, we come back to this is not normal run of the mill stuff. This is outside of the purview of a lot of people. With that, the persistence, the belief in self, and then to get in there and don't delay that care for yourself, your furry family member, whoever it is, the more tenuous we can be in that, the better outcomes we can get because we can keep the body from having to go downhill first before we go uphill again. And I just wanted to add, so just wanted to add that. And now we had a question from Claire, and this really relates to persistence, Claire. Uh, if you don't have a probe, you know, you're using the palm, what to do when treatment calls for a probe? I've been putting the palm as close to the area of treatment as possible. Your instincts are on the money. What you'll need to do is do more time with the treatment, with the palm, uh, and when you don't have the probe, of course, you know, it's going to be, it's going to be faster with the probe. But if you don't have it and you just have the palm, then that's the way to go. What you're doing works well. Keep doing it. Be persistent. And you'll need to do more time in on the treatment. So that would be the general answer to that. So I don't know if I answered your question, Claire. You can turn your mic off and share if you have more to the question or if you have, if I haven't answered it properly for you or sufficiently.